welcome to another episode of Carolyn Talks. This is the podcast Lunch Tuesday channel where I host Carolyn Heinz, film critic and journalist, speak to film creators around the world about their work, the industry, and what inspires them. And today I'm joined by filmmaker Juan Pablo Reynoso to talk about his film, Mad Props, which is a documentary about prop collecting, curation, and, memor- and memorabilia. And it's about the entire process of what inspires people to become prop, collect- prop collectors and curating. And Chris, for me, there's a difference between collecting and curating. Curating is very specific. It's about having a very particular identity of the stories and the props you want to collect. And as well as speaking to people like Alec Gillis, who has worked on films such as Alien and Prey and a whole bunch of other sci-fi films are featured in the documentary. So we'll definitely get into that. But this is a very interesting Uh, thing for me because I love talking to people about the making of film and this documentary encapsulates a lot of what goes in to making films such as the props and costuming so thank you so much Juan for talking to me today (laughs) thanks for having me I appreciate it yes um so the first thing first I have to ask you your filmmaker so tell me a bit about your background and how you got in involved in the film industry um well you know I've I've basically been in the industry in some form since I was a little kid, since I was like six. I started as an actor, actually, in the theater and, uh, you know, did theater my growing up. And then I, I went to uh, got a you know, I went to a university for that um, in New York at Fordham Link, at Lincoln Center. And then um, while, while I was there, um, I had started directing and I'd been writing since I was very young as well. And then I started directing in high school. But then. Um, when I was, uh, at Fordham, um, I got, uh, cast in a whole bunch of, you know, uh, student films and stuff like that for kids at NYU and SVA. And then, um, during that process, I started falling in love with behind the scenes. And so while I was in college, I got the opportunity to be a PA on a little indie film, which never saw the light of day, but, um that was my first uh behind the scenes like experience and the rest is history um and then i actually when i went up i went up the ranks like the traditional ranks of um you know pa and then i became a, a second ad um and then i became a first ad on national commercials and um music videos and that kind of thing um and with my <clears throat> with my try or my bilingualness uh, technically four lingual whatever that is quatrilingual you mean polyglot uh, you're a polyglot <laughs> a polyglot yeah and so um i've done stuff internationally um but uh i i as a director i kind of got delayed in really focusing on my directing career because you know i mean anybody in the major city knows it's once you once you're making a solid living on doing something, it's hard to break free into the things that you really want to do because you're just trying to stay alive, right? And so you don't want to bite the hand that feeds you. So um, eventually, my 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 late wife, she was, um, she said, you know, you gotta you gotta do this. This is what you really want. I wasn't unhappy, but I wasn't doing everything I really wanted to creatively. She's like, you gotta, you gotta focus on on what you really want. It'll be okay, you know. It might hurt for a bit, but let's do it. And so, I did, and uh, I started solely focusing on producing and directing, and um, I was very fortunate. It took off from there, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, tell me a bit about Matt Cross because you've had the experience of working behind the scenes and working on different types of films, just like you mentioned, um, in theater, but also working with music videos and then working as a producer and first AD and second AD. So you have all of this um, knowledge coming from the different aspects of working behind the scenes. So tell me how that plays into um, props because the thing with props is like for the the first and second ADs, you have to make sure that the props are ready for when you're ready to call action. You know, you have to make, you work closely with the prop masters and with the costume designers and the lighting technician. So tell me about how you have been in film. Because the thing is, is a lot of a lot of people when they say I want to be a filmmaker, they think about just directing, telling the the, the actors where to go and that kind of stuff. But I, I don't think a lot of people when they enter into making filmmaking, they don't consider everything that goes into making a film, which is making sure that you know what props you want on set. You know, you know what the co- what the costumes are supposed to look like, and then working with all the people all the teams that are 
men that are working to bring all your this vision to life. Like for instance, the film is about props. So as a director and as a producer as well, you have to know like, okay, this is who I'm gonna reach out to for to design this particular props and which company, which um artists and all of these people coming together to make this particular aspect of making films. So talk to me about that part. <laughs> so so it's a it's a heavy question actually. This is so many uh the, the minutia behind the importance of art in in creating any project is you know from a commercial all the way to a film is 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 a pretty detailed process but i i think early on since since i had an acting background um too i totally i completely understood the importance of of that tactile nature and connection that helps and uh, affect your character as as a performer so that was always in my brain so when i started just directing especially just directing and stuff I knew going into it the importance of uh, of props and wardrobe and stuff and how it can help inform the character. I apologize in ambulance. It was completely <laughs> silent until until just now. Of course, you know that's the way it happens. Um, but um, the process of of uh, selecting um, the art and everything and um, the wardrobe and and. Uh, props for me having that acting background um i like to discuss it with my performers my actors um uh as well to help them be a part of the process in in figuring out what it is that would really help them um inform um, their performance more so whether it's the way something fits uh, uh wardrobe wise and colors and that sort of scheme and things like that and the tiniest little details can can tweak um, the way something is approached. Uh, a lot of people don't realize in, in the general audience, right, that um, like the smallest little detail can really help affect um, the way they approach something within a given moment uh, within the thing. Like, um, and also it it helps really um, connect with the audience too. Um, it might not be. It might seem like. Um, an insignificant thing but like we'll 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 talk about freddy krueger since he's featured in the movie right mm -hmm. uh, the sweater um I, actually i can't remember if he talks about the, he, he did we definitely got him talking about the sweater but i don't know if it's made it into the doc no it's not a fit the film but talk mostly about the claws yeah so but even even so but he he, he talked to us um in, in another instance about the sweater and how so much conversation went into finding that perfect sweater with those quintessential stripes right and um and that's become something that's so identifiable like the two things like even almost more so than the than the melted face is yeah. the claws and the sweater that's what people always think about and recognize within an instant um so you really want to have a conversation this is the way i work too is you really want to have that conversation with your talent and make sure that they're um, involved in that process because you know it's going to not only just save time in the in the filming itself but um, really just affect make or break sometimes the performances and stuff so it's a very detailed process um, that you really have to focus on and I it, it's interesting is as 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 we know we're in the world now where um, props are becoming I don't want to say they're a thing of the past, obviously, but they are becoming affected more and more and more because of CGI, right? So what seems like a physical prop is actually something on like a tennis ball on a stick, right? That just gets changed in post. Um, and I know it's, and it's an acting process in itself, but the thing is, is it's, you're slightly removing yourself from that emotional connection. You know what I mean? And you're, you're putting a, a you're, that organic element of discovery that sometimes comes across in each moment on film is kind of lost. Um, and you're putting that much more on your actor. That's fine because you, you want them to have a truly amazing performance, no matter what. And you, you know, that takes skill just from the actor period, but there's nothing, any actor I've talked to has had tons of CGI experience. So they're just like, yeah, I mean, nothing, nothing is as, is as important as that real tactile thing that i can touch in my hand i don't have to imagine it necessarily you know what i mean mm -hmm. and so they feel slightly removed when it's cgi you know the more they do it the more they get used to it but they they, they always say to me it's like no it's it's 
always we prefer props you know um hands down so um yeah and you find you know some creatives nowadays too like they're 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 less they have less experience working with performance and more on that cgi background and stuff and so actors tend to be almost like an afterthought to the effect hmm. so you're you know i know actors that i work with and stuff that they not so much in this film obviously since it's a documentary but like in my narrative stuff they're they appreciate and love the fact that you know we do things i try to do as much as humanly possible in camera versus in post-production and stuff so that's i hope that answers your question no it does and the thing is is like um as an audience as as audience when we're watching films, especially so much, so many of the films, and I'll, I'll be like, we'll talk about it. Like, I'll just say straight up, like the MCU films or the DCU films are like these films, especially the superhero genre, where so much VFX is used. Like we, the audience, I think it takes a lot of a lot away from our ability to relate to some aspects of the characters. For instance, like um, for using Freddy Krueger. As an example, like Robert Eglin in the documentary, he talks about the different types of um, gloves they had because like some were used, like used actual like blades made from a, um, a fish boning knife and some were like um, resin like to, and, and wood to protect like the performers. And like that, having that tangibility affects the way that they, they perform because you can tell when and actually like the way he grabs someone, you know, this because he has an actual thing attached to his hand that has claws. You know, say so like affects the way that he um he holds it. But if it's a CGI or a strictly a VFX claw, like that tangibility is gone because like he's not holding it. Right. He's not holding his hand like the way you would hold your hand with claws. Mm -hmm. You know, and um. And by the way, the details on each in individual type of claw was like if he if it was like a plastic thing, right? When he's scraping it across the chalkboard or on- You're not gonna get the sound and then the sound, and then that also makes more work for like the Foley artist because the Foley artist is then gonna have to really try to like figure out, okay, like we don't have actual metal. So I'm gonna have to figure out a metal that works with this type of scene, you know? And like it has, he has to like, and I think it's, so I think like for the, the, the Valve VFX is, saving a lot for the studios a lot of money for the studios and are in in work in in some sense is taking away a lot from the performers and mm -hmm. from the audience and another thing is is like when when you're talking about performers like if i always like to use the example of a cup like if is a cup just a cup or is a cup does this cup have a bigger meaning and if the artist doesn't have a, a cup they can't interact with the cup to look at the cup and say you know, oh, like this is an interesting cup. You know, like they don't know what this thing is because they they have no frame of reference for it. It's mm -hmm. the VFX artist working with the director who has to then create this 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 cup after the fact, after shooting has been complete, and after the actor has done their part, the VFX artist then has to come has to composite this entire cup. But the artist and their performance has no frame of reference for this actual cup because they don't know what it's gonna look like. And I think that affects a lot of stuff with like improvisation, mm -hmm. like improvisation, the art of improvisation in these particular films and in the use of smidge VFX is kind of being lost because when you watch like a lot of the behind the scenes um, for these films, like you mentioned, like for again, the MCU films, a lot of these actors, they say, oh, it kind of like affects their performance because they're like acting against a tennis ball, you know? And like the tennis ball has no personality, whereas something that has been crafted whether it's something made specifically for the film or if it's like, I'm um, like using the example of Mickey Rourke, Mickey Rourke, he talked about money, you know, like he has an experience of counting money, you know, and like he knows how money feels. And I say, yes, as a frame of reference where like if the director say, oh, just imagine is this thing and they're like, but what particularly is this thing? What's the exact shape of it? The way you hold it is going to be affected by the shape of it, you know, like a prop gun, like, uh, for instance, a magnum <laughs> a magnum gun is gonna have a completely different shape to a revolver. And the way that and like you know, so it affects the way they interact with it. And we the audience pick up on that. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of the studios, they don't realize that, yeah, we know this. <laughs> like I particularly, and I'm like, I know that you're not acting against a real <laughs> a real cup. You know, I know you're not holding a real cup because like no one holds a cup like this because the actor can't hold a real cup, you know? So like just using that as an example. And then in um, talking about um, 
the, the, the beauty of um, having actual physical props, whether they're made for the film or not, if it's just something that the prop master is just found to say, oh, I know this would be cool for a, a scene. It kind of like takes away the ability to really remember something specific about a scene. Mm -hmm. You know, like for instance, like I'm a very visual person. So sometimes even if I don't remember a character's name, I can remember what a character wore. You know, mm -hmm. I can remember a particular thing that was around them. You know, I can remember, oh, the look of the house, you know, the cost, the set design and everything. Whereas if everything is being done in computer, it's not staying with me. Like I can't, re I wouldn't really remember, you know. And um, I think for, and I think the film kind of highlights that in a kind of like a roundabout way where like for people who collect props, the, the reason they're, they have such an emotional connection to these things is because it stands out in their mind. You mm -hmm. know, all of the things that they collect are tangible, are made by other human beings. Their artwork, his art pieces, things that people took hours and hours and hours to craft and putting little, even though you may not see it on the screen, when you hold it in your hand, you see all the little minute details. And I think your, your film really touches on that. So in saying all of that, first of all, we got to talk about just like making the decision to make um the film because there isn't, I, and I'm, I'll see this now. One of the things that is being lost in filmmaking is like the behind the scenes specials. Growing up, I loved, one of the things I really loved about DVDs is that we would get the behind the scenes specials or even VHS tapes. You know, you get like a, you get right. the actual VHS tape and then you get like a special feature VHS tape that you could rent. And then it was DVDs and you get all these special behind the scenes features and like the making of. And I used to love watching those. I would rent the making of DVDs just to watch them, but we don't get that enough because everything again is VFX. You're not getting any of the making of because like the making of is taking place in a computer. You know, it's not taking place in like a weather factory or ILM. Like you have ILM, um, ILM, but like where's the where's the making of specials? For like these films now, you can't really have them. So talk about like you having your film be like kind of like, I guess like a almost like a, a it's like a curated piece of like prop and prop history, you know, a film prop history in a way that's not being done now. Um. Yeah. You know. It. It's. Uh. I. I. I mean. I. I wanted to. Um. To make sure. Um, I mean, it's hard because you, you also, you know, it could have been like a, you know, a 10 part miniseries, right? Depending on <laughs> <It could> have. <laughs> how much details we wanted to go into. So and at the same time, I wanted it to be something that um, appealed to the 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 nerdiest of enthusiasts, um, but also um, captured the attention of the non um, cinephile as well, you know, people who go to movies as a passive experience, you know? Um, um, and so that was like a, a line I had to balance. Um, and I, it seemed to me that the most interesting thing would be to, to touch upon as much detail as I could without getting too cerebral. Um, and so um, the importance I wanted to show how fascinating it, it was um, behind the scenes, like you're talking about how these things are made um and and why that had such an emotional impact on on um not just the curators and the museum operators and things like that who collect these things but for the for those people um the casual collector too who has them just displayed in their home and everything um and so you i wanted to do um justice to those actual artists who made these things um, because again, it's not just the actor. It's just like somebody is behind those details. Um, so they have, they're just as important, you know, and I say this on all my sets, you know, I too, I always say that I was like, nobody here is bigger is more or less than any. Well, first of all, it should be like that in life period, but on my sets and stuff, there's no, while there is obviously a hierarchy, mm. I don't. I don't allow for anyone to be treated any differently because everybody plays a specific part that's super important to the overall whole. And so I wanted to show these artists and all the work that goes into um, those props and stuff that get created and, and the thought process behind it. Um, and then it was cool because when we did the the, the longest uh, uh, section, obviously, is when we go to Alec Gillis's 
um, Studio Gillis and Amalgamated Dynamics, which is an Oscar winning um, renowned studio and design studio and stuff, um, is having Robert England and, 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 and Lance Henriksen go on the tour with us because then you get to see like almost from, from start to finish, right? The people mm -hmm. who designed it all the way to the people that actually use it. Um, and so showing that interaction and how fascinated they are, especially Robert, because he's he was he's a big nerd, but he the way he was always pointing is like, yeah, I love this detail here. Yeah, this stuff is so important. Right. And so um, um, I found when we had our, our premiere, um, several people who came, <laughs> not several, um, a couple of people um, came up to me and said, you know, they were like, they're like, I got to tell you. I was dragged to this movie by my significant other who's into this. Right. And I thought I was going to be bored out of my mind, but I thought it was fascinating. It was so interesting. Um, and that to me, that's like the biggest compliment because then you're like, um, you just won a new audience member who's now going to probably go see that next movie with a totally different viewpoint yeah. going into it. Um, so that's something that I was really it was really hard. It was difficult to do that, to, to, to pull that off, I think, because, um, you know, it's a film, any film, filmmaking and enjoyment is it's a subjective experience, right? Um, you know, somebody may hate, you know, a, a movie and other per people are going to adore it for whatever reason. Right. It's just, it's a personal experience. And that's the same thing that happens with props. Some people mm -hmm. are more affected by, science fiction props some people are more affected by props from driving miss daisy you know it's all about that emotional connection um that they have in that in that experience and you can't have that experience without the artists behind those props being created hmm. and 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 so now we're going to kind of talk about the main character of this film because while the film is of you go to like you go to paris you go to like Las Vegas, you know, you're in LA and you're in different cities, but the, you, there's one commonality and that's the, um, I'll call him the main character, uh, Tal Bocini, and he's a huge memorabilia collector. And like, he spends a lot of money on these, on these props and the bits and numbers that I know in like a abstract sense that some of these things can sell for like hundreds of thousands of dollars. But like, there's something interesting where you show like him, you show him like on the phone, with like is I guess like his agent in the sense where like they're big, like discussing the bids and how much bids. So like, tell me first about getting in contact with Tom and like, how did you learn about him and about his um, memorabilia collection and working and getting him to agree to do the film? So it was, uh, it was actually well. Here's a little background: is I I've known Tom since he was a little kid. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we we grew up. To, I I was actually raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, and I been in new york for more than half my life and and i we had family in new york too so new york was always my home away from home and the second six days after graduating high school but i was in new york living <laughs> um but uh um i had come back to back and forth to uh, take care of my parents um so the benefit of doing what i do is technically i can be anywhere and do what i do right um and uh when i started coming back i reconnected with tom and learn things about him i was closer with his older siblings um so but then so i learned things about him and he came he came to me one day and he was just like he pitched the the idea oh, okay. uh, and he said hey hey dude i don't know if you knew i was a collector and i was like oh no and first of all by the way i've never been interested in collecting things it doesn't the the most i collect are any new city i go to i get a magnet that's it i <laughs> <laughs> which I get made, which I get made fun of too. My wife, my late wife, would say the same thing. She's like, "Oh my god, you're such a dork." Um, and I was like, if yeah, she, "You've seen nothing yet." <laughs> yeah, it's like if you had to see if if she'd gotten the chance to meet Tom, she'd be like, "Oh no, you're not a dork." Um, <laughs> anyway, so Tom pitched the idea. He's like, "Is there a show? Is there a show in this?" And I said, "Well, first of all, TV. There's the two most difficult, um, um, uh, uh entertainment." um things are music and tv um and if you're not already if you're not a legacy in tv like you come from you know a a, a long long line of tv royalty 
um, or you're not already super connected or you're a movie star already, you're not, it's, it's so difficult to get into TV. Um, and so I said, I said, while I do know some people, I don't, the chances of me getting, it's going to take years if at all. Um, and so I said, I think you're better off doing a documentary and then using that as a way to pitch as a TV show. So you're getting a movie and you, uh, which gives you the chance as a businessman to actually perhaps make some money back versus spending money on a pilot that will never turn out to be anything. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe we can use that. And as a result, we are actually in very active conversations with four majors uh, networks slash streamers that are now interested in doing the show as a result of, of the movie. Um, and so um, Tom, and one of the things he was most concerned about, by the way, was the fact that he, uh, he didn't want it to seem like, and this was something that I, I insisted on too, is he was nervous. His biggest concern was coming across as some sort of entitled jerk right because oh i have this money that i'm I'm spending um and so that was one of the things that i wanted to make sure came across too not just for him so that he would look good because he by the way one of the first things people say is he's like the most endearing person he just seems so fun and not, that is 1000 percent authentic he is hands down one of the kindest sweetest most enthusiastic and optimistic positive people i've ever known in my entire life um but uh uh he i wanted to make sure that we showed that it wasn't really about the money right this isn't some abstract world that is is virtually impossible because otherwise it, how do you connect with it right to me there, there's those people that love seeing all these people like on these reality shows right and they blast this is this much money, this much money, right? And they they just find it, they like live vicariously through that. Oh, I wish I was rich. Um, but in this case, it was really so, it was about showing that you don't have to even be wealthy to be a part of this community. You can be, um, and that's why when we were going into it, I, 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 I didn't, I wanted to do it organically and discover things so that when we were at the actual prop store auction, um, I was just when when we met that um, one of the final people that we see on camera, which yeah, is Alistair, I believe his name. Yes. When when my when my producer, because one of my producer's jobs was to specifically go around meeting individual people, because it's impossible for me to do that. Yeah. Their job was to go around and get little stories from everybody to see who might be super interested in getting on camera. She came to me and said, "Oh my God, this guy!" And she told me the story, and I was like, "We have to talk to him." And to me, he's the emotional core of that the entire movie. He is that every man that really shows that anybody can be a part of this. Mm. You know, this is a guy who makes ten pounds, ten pounds an hour, um, and it's like, and and lives at home and the blah, blah, and he's he just has this dream of having this one little obscure thing from something that barely anybody even really knows um, that is within his budget range and reach, mm. right? And to me, that was just beautiful. Um, um, and people have told me in the screenings too. They're like, "Yeah, that's when when I saw that guy, I was just like, oh, that moved me like crazy." And I was like, "Yeah." Um, so that was super important to me. Um, and then having all those juxtapositions really starts to help show that just because Tom is of a of a certain ilk, you know, and ability uh, uh, financially doesn't mean he see, feels like he's better or or any than anyone else everybody in this community is an equal and mm -hmm. that's that's one of the things that I, I actually found very fascinating about it doesn't make me want to collect props but that's just me i mean <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just wired that way no it's true because the thing is like but um alistair like you know i could kind of i can relate to alistair i can't relate to tom or to any of the other guys because i don't got that kind of money but like alistair i can relate to Alistair. he's like i'm here just to get like the technical drawing of a film and i remember it's a show that his he said his brother named him after the character in the show <laughs> right and so like for him that has a personal connection because like he that's something that's connected to him and his family personally and like that i can relate to and it made me kind of think if i could if and it made me think if i could have an actual prop 
from a show or TV or film, what would it be? And I, I started to think, and I was like, I, I was thinking, if I could, it would be the, kat the katana that Michonne has from The Walking Dead. But I know that's like <laughs> impossible. But if I could, if I had the money, it would be that. And then maybe like a replica of the train from the KTX from Train to Busan. And that's like one of my all-time favorite movies. Oh, Train to Busan? I just rewatched that like a week ago. It's like one of my all-time favorite movies. Top three for me. And if I could get like a, a replica like the KTX, the train, or and then one of my other favorite movies of all time is the um Lady Vengeance from the Vengeance trilogy by Park Chan Wook. You know, everybody knows Old Boy. Like the second the the second film in that series, um, Lady Vengeance is actually I think better than Old Boy. Mm -hmm. But there's a, if I could get like a something from like maybe her coat that like she has a, a spectacular black leather coat. Like that's something that I would and it, I would wear it too. I wouldn't just keep it. I would wear it. But like it, it made me think, well, <laughs> if if I could have something, what would it be? And then I I started to think, okay, like even if I can't have these things, you can have people who make like make replicas or even paintings of them. Like I have two paintings in my I that I have. One is a painting of um Okoye and um Nakia from um Black Panther, and it's a painting that I got at uh, Comic Con. I went to Comic Con in twenty nineteen. And I got another painting of Moana. And like there you can have these, there may not be actual replicas or things from the film, but if you go to places like San Diego Comic Con or go to like con conferences, you can get like pieces of this memorabilia. You know, you can have people who create these things out of the pure love for it. And for me, doing my, I think for me, doing interviews with like filmmakers, kind of me is like my own <laughs> way of <laughs> collecting memorabilia because I get to talk to the people who make these films and make these stories and are involved in the filmmaking process, they could look at it for me. You know, I'd be like, you know what? That's how I'm going to look at it. I'm collecting my own. <laughs> I remember. Well, by the way, it, it, incidentally, you know, the, um, you, 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 people need to realize too, that it's not, um, if you put in your mind all from the get go, Oh, there's no way I'll be able to afford that. You're, you're, you're the one selling yourself short because if you Look at Sean Lespanera, who was in the uh, our the guy who had the a lot of Wolverine stuff. Yeah, very, very modest home, right? And not a not like oh, he's not a wealthy person, right? And he has like a massive collection of props and stuff. So it's just like rather than hey, you know what? Maybe I'm just not. I'll I'll drink one less latte every day. You know that I that I buy. There's ways around it. It's just budgeting, right? But he. For instance, the hammer, the 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 Mjolnir. God, I always mess up. Mjolnir, Mjolnir. You know, <laughs> from I uh, from Thor um, and the Avengers, you would think that that being such an iconic prop that they would be crazy expensive, but no, they're not. It's all about researching and finding. You know, maybe um, uh, the the Mjolnir that I I got wasn't was only was briefly on screen right and they made 20 of these so the price automatically went down because there were so many versions of it made for the movie right. so that's that's one thing and you know the the more it's been used on screen and it's proved that it was screen used the more expensive it's going to get but don't sell yourself short so if somebody really wants something if you really want that michonne thing remember that that was for like 12 seasons it's and, there, well, there's don't forget there's a new season coming out. And, the one and, that yes, so there's, like, probably, there's probably a collection of the sword out the, the of the katana out there. No, they probably made like forty. Afford. They probably made like forty of those anyway. So you're right. You know, maybe. more, more. I guarantee you, more than that. Yeah. So and so like in talking about that in like in like the different ways of collecting, um, I like that the film also shows different types of collectors. Like like we mentioned, there's like the people who are curators who like. Like one of the people you went to, he was, it's a, uh, I put his name here. Um, His name is Luca uh, Cardini yeah. and he's a props curator in Italy. And like his setup is like a museum. And, and it's because he has, he's like, I want, I want to collect something very specific. And there's, and so like, that's his method of curating where he like, he wants things that have been done only once on screen and like their particular size and a particular, um, and I, and I noticed like a lot of them have a very particular in a particular genre of filmmaking. So there, there's like that. And then there's one person um, who has like things worn by the actual actors Like he has like um, one of the dresses worn by Whitney Houston. And it doesn't only have to be movie related. It can be related to like conference um, con um, concert performances like from Michael Jackson 
and you know, like the shirt that Aunt Jamie Foss wore. So there's different types of collectors. You know, there's people who focus on mainly on small, like the action figures from the 70s and the 80s. And then there's people who have like museums that have the like, massive um, actual, <laughs> like full scale replicas of things. So like, I like that the film focuses on on these different types of curation. So talk to me about finding, so we talked about Tom, so talk about the other people that you interviewed, like like working and like you and your producer saying, okay, like there's a museum in France, like, how do we get in contact with them? And like, you know, like finding the collector in England and that, and getting contact with them. That was one of the, the, the hardest parts of the entire process because um, while it's a very welcoming community to collectors themselves, um, they're very wary about outsiders mm. um, for, for many different reasons for, I don't want to get robbed if they find out what I have and stuff like that and et cetera, et cetera. And um, so I had to basically, um, I just, I, you know, from scratch, I was like, Looked at Facebook groups, try to see this. Can I get into this? And like at first, people were denying me because you're not you're not a collector, so we're not just gonna let anybody into this thing, right? Um, so it took several months. Um, oh, actually, it took about two months until finally I found a collector who was in the movie. Um, J um, um, um uh, Nick Giggy and his cousin, his uh, cousin Jacob, in mm -hmm. Colorado. Um somehow um i found them and he responded um and then he just did his due due jill do sorry english due diligence on me and saw hey this guy's he's for real he's not just some joe schmo he, he's done all, all this work he's he's in the business for a long time so he and i chatted and then once he realized i oh, know this guy's legit and he really wants to make something that's not like i'm not mocking this the the community or anything like that he being a super respected member of the collecting community started telling everybody else hey guys i want to let you know about this guy but he's making a, a thing and then from that point on it was just like then i couldn't i couldn't I couldn't fight them off with a stick. They started all finding me after that. So we just did a, I just made like a, a, a database of every collector, everything they had, as much detail as we could. And then we just kind of, I wanted it to be as international as I possibly could to show how just like traditional art, um, they exists, uh, it exists worldwide. Um, these people from just, passing collectors to curators and museums and stuff too um um so i had to pick and choose unfortunately and and then in the end just based on budget you know because we we had a decent budget but we didn't have it was an unlimited right mm -hmm. so we could only go so far and then obviously too one of the most expensive parts of making the film by far the most expensive thing was travel so um to get to these places so we had to there was a, a finite amount of things we could cover um in order to achieve the basic structure of what i wanted to achieve in the film um which is why i'm very happy that i have that database because now i was able for the pitch to the networks and streamers to do outlines showing all the different episodes across multiple seasons that are possible because of all the collectors that i now have in my database um so that's basically yeah how i went about it it was just flat out cold calling or cold emailing if you will mm. um so a couple of things you mentioned i know i need to but for something i, would, I do want to talk about first before i forget is um you mentioned the budget so talk to me about budgeting a film like this because you did travel to like england paris and um and italy and also to different states within the u.s so talk about the budgeting and like how you got the money to make this film and i was wondering also about licensing because you are showing um scenes from different films and from different studios you do have to pay licensing fees i would i would imagine for showing like actual scenes with dialogue and then also like possibly um with copyright so talk about the logistics of making a film like this yeah so um um so for the for the investor and stuff it was really just about um um kind of setting like a standard as far as like how much does the average um documentary 
of this scale cost? Like what's the average cost of those? So you have to kind of research all those things and then you have to base it, base it upon like how much was this film. And this is all information that, you know, if you're, if you know what you're doing, you can find like this film was made for this much and it's sold for this much. And so they were able to profit this much. So you have to have all these comparables to, to, um, and, and projections to, to give to the investor. And right. So that's kind of how we wound up where we wound up, uh, budgetarily. Um, but then also, um, um, uh, Oh gosh, sorry. What was the second part of that question? Getting the licensing for like oh, yeah. The so yeah, um, that is you know that's a fear, right? So one of the things was, <clears throat> can we shoot this in a way where the pieces themselves are enough, or do we need to have references? And so it's really just about. Um, I think the difference was is that while it's cool because the collector who loves the Mjolnir again for that reference from whatnot, they know that it's from an Avenger movie or from Thor or whatever, right? So they don't necessarily need to see a clip because they've seen it a million times. But for the average moviegoer who might not have seen that, having a clip is handy, right? So we we didn't focus so much on what clips we could use. We just focused on just the props. Then when I went down and started whittling, whittling down the script into what would become the actual final out, uh, outline of the film <clears throat> in post, that's when I went and started saying, okay, so here would be a great moment for this, this, this. Then you have to understand the process of, you know, just laws and stuff like that. So obviously I had budgeted uh, a, 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 legal, a legal clearance uh, 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 attorney. So we had one of the best uh, legal clearances attorneys in the in the industry, um, which also not as expensive as people would think. You know what I mean? It just all depends on how how much you need. Right. Uh, so I'd say these are the clips we need, or I'd like to have ideally. And then they're like, okay, well, this actually, if you only use a certain length, um, and it's used for a particular purpose, in other words, you're utilizing it doesn't make isn't like deliberately a manner for you to make money for yourself in other words you're stealing from us right but you're using it as an homage and as a reference it's kind of like just like any like uh thesis right you mm -hmm. you know you gotta put all your all the info in the in the end too right, you know? make sure you're not plagiarizing <laughs> exactly and so um that's that's basically it as long as you're giving the proper credit and the proper you're utilizing what legally you're okay to use and you have a a a, a legal background uh, a legal counsel that actually scrutinized everything and can prove that yes it was used for this and that was the purpose and blah 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 then you're set you know mm -hmm. what i mean so we, we didn't we didn't honestly we didn't spend a dime not one dime it was all fair use so um, that's how we were able to get um, all the clips that we used. Um, and we could use more, but, you know, I also didn't want it to become about the movie, you know, right? all the clips. I didn't want it to be like a clip thing. Um, and because that becomes a crutch in and of itself. Um, but without those, we wouldn't be able to have attracted uh, more general audiences. Right. So that they feel more connected now because they also have a reference um, because of those clips and stuff. And so that's how, how we went about it otherwise it would have been completely cost prohibitive mm -hmm. you know? yeah. wouldn't have been able to make the movie at all right and and in talking about that so like and i think it's even for someone like me who watches oh so many movies and tv shows like there were some references that made me curious like there's the um i don't think I've, i think i've seen the outsiders maybe once years ago but because you went to the actual house from the film like they built the entire house for the film it made me curious about going and looking up the film and like refreshing my memory because it's been literally years since i watched that as a young 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 child <laughs> back in the day so like that so like because you had you didn't need you i think you had like one clip from the film but because the house itself serves as a reference and like because the way how they have the the design of the house set up it like it makes it makes the audience more curious to watch it and like um even for like Mickey Rourke, you didn't add a clip of the film he was referencing, 
but it would make you go and look up on his um, IMDb and say, okay, like what film could he possibly be talking about? And then make you curious to go and watch the film that mm-hmm. he's referencing, right? And and so like, yeah, like making sure that you use particular scenes from specific movies, um, for, for especially when you have the actors talking about it, you can use the clips from those films because it makes a, a kind of like, in a way shows like how the actors themselves are fans of these props, you know, like how they themselves have a personal connection, which is kind of like what we were going, what we were talking about at first, where like having the props not only helps the actor with their performance, but it actually shows that they themselves are fans of the artwork, the craft of making props because they have so much respect for the prop masters and for the makers. And, and I think it's important for the audience to get to see that the actors, they themselves have connections to these things so um so now talk about um getting like robert eglin mickey roy and um and oh my gosh why am i drawing a blank on his name Lance, and, and right on on to be to be in the film well so we had a i mean i had a laundry list of different actors we wanted to get to like we because we show like rocky four's uh boots for uh, dolph lundgren's character of ivan yeah. draco that tom owns um, we try to get them and so some some people a lot of people were either not available or not interested for whatever reason or another um, or I don't do documentaries etc cetera, etc cetera. so there were tons of reasons and so um, but when it came down to it a lot of it had to do with the fact that the majority of props of all the lists that came to me from collectors as we were prepping the film um, a lot of it was aliens aliens is like the alien franchise was like one of the most collected uh, uh uh film franchises uh out there so lance uh was you know uh, you're either uh, you either love aliens more or you love alien more like the first <laughs> yeah you know, so <laughs> aliens was like i like them both equally because i just think they're two totally different kind of styles um um so anyway uh, to, it seemed like a no-brainer to get to get Lance and you know and my, one of my producing partners in LA um is very friendly with all the agencies and that's how we were able to get Lance and Robert and um um Robert especially was was a was an exciting get for Tom because you know he nerded out he was just like oh my god Freddy Krueger you know because of his he, he originally wanted to be when he was a kid he was interested in being a special makeup effects um artist in the industry um so for him that was super cool um and anybody who's a child of the 80s you know essentially it, it, regardless if you love horror you're like oh cool that's cool like it's that retro thing you're like oh that's awesome pretty Krueger, cool um and then mickey was uh i i i i knew that mickey was really more of a <laughs> I, I, I knew he was going to be more of a character if you will um <laughs> a little saltier than the others um so i thought he would be an interesting person just to get his take on it because he had a totally different like um like his thing was like he he doesn't actually love big props and and stuff he he thinks it's a crutch yeah um, so for him it's the smaller details that matter versus like the big things you know um so like for him, he didn't really enjoy the overall process of a lot of his films especially the bigger hollywood ones he actually doesn't didn't enjoy doing them for those reasons right um versus robert and lance who were like super excited about the that art artistic connection with the prop makers and the wardrobe and all that stuff they totally love it and you know, it's just different every actor is different so that's it so i wanted to show those differences and stuff hmm. and then obviously cost prohibitive it was cost prohibitive to have 15 actors in it you know what i mean so it's just like just like the couldn't go to every city to film i couldn't get every actor i wanted to to do it right so no so, i think they, and it would have been a 50 50 hour movie <laughs> yeah no for sure but i think the ones that you did get were important because like again aliens and aliens and then like and then and having them go to the the, the studio with um, alec and have them interacting with them and showing that they themselves were geeking out over like the animatronics and stuff i think that was really interesting and very was dumb luck too by the way just uh-huh. change that was dumb luck that um, we happened to be um, shooting all that around the same time, and they happened to both know Alec. Mm. They're like, I was like, oh, what if you can we do the interviews at Alec's place? This is where we shot those interviews. Yeah, like, 
hey, would you mind hanging out and doing it? Th- yeah, we'd love to. That's awesome. Because to them, it was just hanging out. And they're geeks. So they were all into it. Right. So, and I think, and like for me, like I personally, I'm the kind of person, I've only done a few set visits. And like, but I love being on set and seeing the actual props and like the how, like how they build houses. Like, uh, so many people don't realize that for a lot of films and shows, like they actually build actual houses and stuff. And like every, so many things are made specifically for these films and like have, having them be just as nerdy about the whole process as like as we would say regular fans it kind of re- remind people that yes they are actors but they're also regular people too and they themselves are fans of movie making and then having um with Alec in particular he is the films that he's worked on are some of the films that he's worked on are some of the most like popular sci-fi films ever you know and like what seeing like the again seeing the artists like one of the guys that were there was working in studio and working on on props at that time so you got to see that but then also I like that there is um someone else that you had in the film you, you okay yeah no my one of my my dogs is <laughs> crying for attention inside oh okay yeah <laughs> my dog is here my dog is here next to me so every time I keep looking at the car my eyes to see if she's gonna do something but she's good now um <laughs> but one of the other people that I like that you have in the film is um David Reed James and he's a sculpture and a prop maker and he's worked on some other he's worked both with physical props but I think he's also done like some VFX first because like, he's worked on films like um like Black Panther and then that when he was talking it kind of made me think I would definitely like to have something from from the Black Panther um film you know and like I think it's again also important to show the people making these um these art these artworks because something else that that was really sticking on my mind is when you were interviewing the other collectors they know the films, they know the details, they know the directors and the actors, but they don't name the people who make these things, you know? And like, and that kind of made me think, so many people, I collect these thousands upon thousands of people, of, of and people, and collect all these from the smallest little pieces of art and sculpture to like full costumes, you know, and everything, but they couldn't tell you the name of the person making them. You know, they well, don't know. And, and it's kind of hard though, because there's so many artisans that go. They, they are, but you know what I mean? But there's like kind of like this thing where in Hollywood where you don't really focus on the people who are crafting them, you know. So that when you have when you show him, I was like, I was so happy that you showed him because I'm like, yes, yeah, show us the people making these things, you know. Same thing like we were no costume designers for films like you have again using Black, um, Black Panther as a reference. Ruth E. Carter, but she's just the leader of the costume department. She has like a whole team of costume makers. An army. But we don't we don't know those we don't know the names of those people, right? So I think films like this and documentaries like this are important to kind of like in a way humanize the the, the filmmaking process. Yeah. You know, so it's not just the glitz and the glamour. It's like you gotta remember there are people who are spending hours and so much labor and time and effort and talent and and, t- and and energy making these things like they also deserve acknowledgement as well yeah no and and there were I, I honestly we we also we did film other people like david but um again it was just a matter for the sake of time like i mm-hmm. i could you know there's tons of stuff oh we i can't even tell you how much we shot we have so much footage that obviously didn't make it into the film but would the you fun- do a part two then no, no, I think, well, some of the stuff like I'm actually, you know, uh, I can use for the show, for the TV. Right, if you, that's why I'm hoping you get the show. Because- yeah, there's some stuff I can use later on and stuff. But yeah, I'm, but yeah, I mean, yeah, for the sake of time and whatnot, I couldn't obviously include everybody. And uh, mm-hmm. there was some interesting stuff, but it was, you know, you, you go down a rabbit hole and it's just like impossible. And the same thing with like costumes and stuff. I was super interested in getting into costumes after we were with Paul and his little mini home museum, right? With, with the michael jackson and all that stuff but the yeah. thing is you start to go down this rabbit hole and you you know it's again and then it just just will become like this huge thing so these are things that i would like to go back to and visit in more detail which is easier to do in a show versus you know a, a film so yeah i hope you do get the um to, i hope you do get the um get the show because i that's one of my that's one of the reasons that i do interviews is to not only for my own curiosity and knowledge, but also to like for people to like realize that film isn't just the director and the main actors. You know, film is costume designers, film is the lighting technician, film is the set designer, film is a prop master, you know, film is the accountant, 
you can't make a film without your accountant. You can't make a film without craft services, you know? Like you have all of these people involved in the filmmaking process. So I really do hope you get to do the show to kind of like give them their own moment and time in the spotlight, especially with the way that film is going now, where, as we mentioned in the beginning, so much of it is VFX. And like Hollywood is pushing this whole AI, generative AI thing. And I'm like, this is kind of like trying to send things like tangible costume design the way of the dinosaurs, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and so I think it's important to remind people, this is why these things are important. These uh, these aspects of, of, of the behind the scenes or what gets you to, or what leads to the final product that you spend so much energy and time loving. You know, like you go to the film, you go to the theater, and you fall in love with um Star Wars. You can't have a Star Wars without a prop master, you know, like, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, you, and you can see the difference, right, between like the, the original trilogy and then the newer trilogy, which is um, where, where it's like clearly so effects heavy versus the original stuff where they actually mm-hmm. used massive models and stuff versus cgi and stuff and that by the way it's not i don't i don't i no way mean to like trash talk cgi because i love big cgi spectacles i think for sure super fun and that's an artistry in and of itself but for the sake of this particular process and 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 this storyline it's it the tactile thing is different um so that's no disrespect to the artist well, no, for, for 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 sure because i have great respect for vfx artists because the the way they create something from a few lines of code in a computer, and my brain does not comprehend like making code. So like I have huge respect for for those guys and for everyone who works in VFX and like I didn't know people on, on Twitter that I'm mutual with who works for ILM, you know, and who worked on like Star Wars and Star Trek and all these shows. So I have great respect for them. Is just but they themselves also talk like we talk a lot on Twitter and stuff. We also they themselves have a great respect for the tangible aspects of film you know they themselves are fans of props you know they themselves they themselves are fans of like costume designing and actual painting and all of this stuff and so i think for me I, it's more about for me it's about how the studios are looking at film now more than the creators itself it's the studio so much of this generative ai is coming push is coming from the studio execs you know where is like, do people even understand filmmaking do you even understand and love the industry and the genre of art that you are yeah that you're involved in and then it's like it's all about the money making but I'm like we people fell in love with film because of these things like if you're taking away the things that we love about film like what are you doing <laughs> you know so like I think the filmmaking industry is changing and the funny thing is is like one of the questions I did I something I do want us to um to talk about before we wrap up is in the seven, and it's mentioned in the film, the seventies and the eighties was a very pivotal time in Hollywood, in the and not just in Hollywood, but in the international uh, film industry, because the seventies and eighties is when films where people really start to pay attention to props and collecting props, you know, and this is where the studios started to say, hey, wait, if we make a film like Back to the Future, we can actually start to sell memorabilia, you know, they're like, this is another um, uh, another avenue of making money you know and then started working with places with things like like mcdonald's in particular where they'd be like how about we work with mcdonald's and have them to make replicas of these things from shows and films and sell them to consumers you know and then like film became more it has it has become much more consumer based where it's like everyone has kind of like maybe a little maybe a replica or a toy a plastic toy of of something that like you go to an amusement park or a theme park and you can shoot a balloon and you win a stuffed toy, a stuffed replica of a dinosaur from Jurassic Park or whatever, you know, can might not be the actual thing because of corporate purposes, but you know it's a dinosaur referencing um Jurassic Park, you know. And so I want us to talk a bit about the consumer aspect of filmmaking and how they the I think the idea of memorabilia collecting. Is different now than it would have been in like the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s is a bit more it's a, I think it's a bit more different now I think people are again and I think it's because there's not many films now where you can look at a film and say I want to collect I want a collectors uh, the thought just occurred to me okay an example would be the Batmobile mm-hmm. nice the Batmobile like I remember like there were collectors um memorabilia small little replicas of the batmobile being sold we don't have many films like that where you can like kind of say oh wouldn't it be cool to have a replica of the batmobile 
And I think it's kind of funny that like, you have, again, using Black Panther, there's no replicas of the spaceship that T'Challa and Okoye flew. Mm -hmm. And I and it I think like Hollywood's kind of moving away from that, you know, where it's like they're not really catering to the love of these small aspects of the film. It's more about the actual brand itself, the Black Panther brand. We want you to love the brand of Black Panther. We want you to love the MCU as a brand, but they're not really giving us actual things to love as part of these. You know what I mean? So I want you to talk a bit about the change, how it's kind of gone from this is almost kind of doing like a full 360 where it's kind of like going from no memorabilia to collect to now all of the memorabilia you could possibly want and collect to now there's not really anything to collect. Um, I I kind of feel like they're actually um, I don't want to say there's been like a resurgence necessarily, but I, I do think that there's I do, I do, I, I, as, as this, by the way, because as this world, as this world of collecting becomes more and more respected, which it has in the past 15, 20 years, especially, um, and the value is starting to really be seen behind that, I think it's going to change and it is going to come back to, back to that heyday of having more and more pieces, um, uh, out there and stuff, you know, um, not just the, the physical things, but also the, like I said, everybody could own like a replica uh, of the thing and stuff. So I think it's, I, I honestly think it's going to be, it's going to become more and more popular and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's a movement that's already been happening. Uh, I think the problem with like paying respect to, to the artist and stuff, that's something that's going to um, probably stay like that. You know, people are still not going to really necessarily fully under uh, grasp the importance of the artist behind these things. But but the overall respect to props and and costumes and stuff like that, I think it is getting better um, and more important. Not it's not going to change the fact that CGI is still going to be the thing, right? But I think they're going to start seeing that more and more, like studios, um, and they're seeing more and more the value of it as they've opened major, they've opened their own major museums for for um, props and and stuff from from right. Film. And so like the props are going there, so they're not really going into collectors because the collectors, well, this. Well, they needs can't. They can't, can't hold everything. They, I mean, they're, it's not like they're going to put fifty Mjolnirs on display, right? They're going to put like a specific one that is the most valuable one, right, or whatnot. There, I'm sure there was probably. I don't know if there were more than one ruby slippers, but uh, from Wizard of Oz. But obviously, they're going to have like the the hero one and somebody else in a private collection might have, you know, blah, 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 blah. So, um, but yeah, so I think they're, they're starting to really um, grasp the importance uh, behind it, both artistically and culturally and, um, you know, behind those things. So, you know, and I think like Black Panther is a good example of something that like culturally it, it really um, had a powerful effect in, in um, for African, uh, African culture and stuff like that. Right. That was, what inspired so much of the props and, and wardrobe, mm -hmm. especially, right? So like head masks and things like that and that sort of beautiful world and the way they recreated that market, right? In in um, Wakanda, right? And stuff and paid such beautiful reverence to that and whatnot. That, you know, that's also important. I think that's an even greater thing. Not only did it showcase possibility of some cool pro by the way the spaceship i just don't think it was featured enough for it to be really anything that anyone cared about um as much as they do like you know the black panther outfit and uh yeah well and that's on display because i actually saw that in person i went when i went to San Diego comic con in um 2019 they had all the costumes on display and i got to i did get to see them up close and like the detail that they put into those costumes and i, I interviewed i've interviewed um ruthie carter a couple of times and i'm just like oh nice just, I'm just like, I want to touch them. But like, yeah, but like the thing is, again, like, that's like, <laughs> this needs like, we're going to hold on to these things. You can't come and buy them. Right? So, you know, it's not like I can find my, but which is also in a good way because it means that they're not in a private collection where like limited people can see them. But if they're in a, in a studio or a museum, like people can like go and watch and, and, and look at all of look at Yeah. I mean, I think it's cool. It's it's cooler for everybody to get a chance to see it, you know. Yeah, and, and then as you as the Mona Lisa, they all, everybody wants to see it, right? Yeah, and then as you as you were talking, I did remember like for the Barbie movie, Mattel 
is back on their grind now. Like they're like doing the whole Mattel universe. I hope it never happens, please. For like, that's for a whole host of reasons. But yeah, but then it was but as you were talking about, the, oh wait, yeah, Mattel is talking about doing the whole Barbie, Barbies, Barbies, Barbies universe, which is like absurd, but <laughs> Yeah, that was like that's like a that was like a it's a blessing and a curse, right? I mean, I think the movie in general was a very powerful film in terms of like feminism and and showcasing individuality and stuff like that. But at the same time, you know the the commercial aspect to it that's going to result from its success is yeah, it's going to be like Barbie Inception. It's going to be like a Barbie of a Barbie movie of a Barbie. You like it's like what. <laughs> But um, uh, but something um. So before we wrap up, I do like I want you to talk now about your um upcoming projects because we have we had talked about it a bit before we began recording. Yeah, yeah. So talk to me about your next um. Oh, first of all, no, I want us to talk about that first, and then where people can watch um Mad Props after. But first, talk us tell us about your next project. What are yeah. you working on? Yeah, so we're going into production on a a a, a, a supernatural horror thriller called Bears. Um. Mm-hmm. That uh, is set to start filming in the summer, uh, probably June. Um, actually, I have a call right after this interview um, um, for that. Um, so we it stars Rita Moreno, uh, Harvey Keitel, uh, Rosalind Sanchez, Udo Kier. Um, and then we have a couple of other names that might be joining the cast as well. It's a small cast, but it's a very it's a very intimate film and takes place almost in almost entirely in one location. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very creepy little story, but I I wrote it, um, and uh, but I wrote it specifically with a female director in mind. Like I thought it would be because it's a female centric film, and I was like, I feel like it's it it's better for a female to direct this. So we have a great director named Sonia O'Hara, who's actually in the process of exploding as a director. So um, we're super psyched about that and going into production on that. Uh, and then after that, we have a film called Cry Baby Hill, which is a horror comedy. Um, and uh, we've started, we've started attaching some well-known talent to that as well. And hopefully that'll shoot late summer. And then we have a Western uh, and, and I'm directing that one and I wrote it and I'm directing that one. And then the Western called Whirlwind, I, I wrote and I'm directing as well, which is, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a drama. It's, an, it's a slight action, but more just like a, a romantic drama uh, set in 1865. Um, and so that's it. But then we have a whole bunch of other things, you know, we have the show and we have the show version of Mad Props and the works. Mm-hmm. I have two other documentaries that, that, that have come as a result of the success so far of Mad Props and uh mad props uh, it's gonna have a small theatrical rollout in the few cities um including france and italy but um a few cities in the states and california and uh, texas and uh, oklahoma um and then uh, uh that starts in about at the end of on march 1st actually and then after that, it'll be available for the masses uh, on TVOD and, you know, for rent and buy, and you can buy it and rent it on um, just about every major platform. Uh, and then we're still in the process of uh, getting the licensing together for the home it will have on like a streamer, like a Netflix. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and that would be for the end of April. So, yeah. Okay. So it'll be, it'll be available for the masses, masses in just a little over a month. You're gonna have a busy rest of 2024. <laughs> like, what? Well, right? I'm excited. You're working on. <laughs> and mm-hmm. one thing I did want to ask, I forgot to ask earlier, and you mentioned like the importance of having a female director for theirs. I want to ask. I noticed for the film there aren't any female collectors, in, but in, within the film there itself. are. There are, but they're very, they're they're way there's way fewer than there are, you know. And there's a lot of husband and wife collectors um, mm. as well. Um, but again, it was just a matter of like. Uh, first of all, I didn't. They didn't. They didn't really pop up in the re- initial research when I was m- putting together the list of collectors. Um, but then when we went to prop store for the auction, uh, I met a bunch. Uh, yeah, there were some there. Um, yeah. In yeah. So some of them. We almost went to shoot one that was in England. This uh, Emma, this Emma, uh, Emma Jane and Napier is a collector um, that we met there and whatnot. And she has like she supposedly has like a bunch of cars and stuff too. <laughs> So I was like, oh, that sounds great, but we just didn't have the time. Just didn't have the time. We, were, we, we weren't there for like 
two weeks. We were just there for a few days. Oh, okay. Well, I, that would be hers. Would be interesting because I'm actually. I used to be very interested in cars when I was younger. I used to watch shows like Orba Holland, and um, there was an, an English show where they would talk about both like cars for like racing, but they also felt cars from like films like the Aston Martins. And I was like, if I had money, the car I would own would be an Aston Martin, which is a car James Bond drives. But like. But like it she it she would be interesting like for the car collectible. So we wrap up here now. But again, thank you so much, Juan, for talking with me. And I hope this the show does get made because I do miss the, the behind the scenes features we used to get for films. And this I think like for map props, it does serve as a behind the scenes um look at film and the collectible and the collecting and memorabilia process. So um, I I I hope a lot of people get to watch it and will be interested in watching the films mentioned in the in the in the documentary so thank you so much Yay. no I, I i can't thank you enough for having me it was really it's really um, it was my pleasure so um and i'm so glad that you enjoyed it enough to spread the word and stuff and hopefully you know you're you'll be able to spread it to more and more audience members i will so everyone this was another episode of carol and tossing in this episode i spoke to filmmaker juan reynoso to talk about his documentary mad props detailing the life and adventures of prop collectors and museum curators for films of all genres from hollywood and all around the world and it was really interesting to get to, to watch this film because it reminded me so much of film of the blooper reels that we used to get at the end of films and this behind the scenes footage that we used to get you know in dvds and vhs states where we used to see like the you'll see like the actors and the directors using the props but also sundays you'd also get a, a tidbit of like in the productions uh, rooms where like you see the prop masters and the prop makers making these things and costume designers working with them and for me i've personally done interviews with like costume designers and production designers and i've never interviewed a prop maker i'm gonna make that one of my goals for this year but i've been i've done set visits you know where i've seen the prop masters working with the props you know laying them out on set for the cast to use so it was like kind of interesting and cool to get to talk to Juan about that aspect of filmmaking and film and film fandom and film curation and museum curation but also because he himself is a filmmaker who has worked on so many different projects he has that background knowledge of it from a fan but also as someone who's di who directs people on how to use these things so it was interesting to get to speak to him and I thank him very much for talking with me about the film and I, and I think also making it because I think as I mentioned in the interview so many people don't have an appreciation of the people who make these props they love the props they collect them but they don't really know the people who make them you know and even sometimes like I'll say the studios don't really show value to these people like if you watch like the a lot of the um big award shows now they don't pay attention to these things that, like, you know, back in the day, like you'd watch like the Oscars, for instance, you'd have like, these special, like they do make a big production of having the, the the actors wear their costumes, you know, to show like the audience and the people watching these things on TV, the costumes being worn in real life, not just on screen, but in real life. And like you'd have reenactments of like specific scenes. I remember one of the ones that sticks in my head is the scene um, from Craft, you know, it was like this big movement. <laughs> choreography of dancing and like singing the theme song for the film but we haven't had that kind of appreciation for this aspect of filmmaking art in a while so I think the film is really interesting in that way and hopefully you know like he gets to make it into series and people get to watch it and so and I and I hopefully as I said I hope we get to speak to a prop maker and a prop master sometime this year and that would be really cool I'm going to make that one of my goals. But I hope you guys enjoy listening to this interview. Of course, you can watch the video version of this and other interviews that I've done on my YouTube channel. That's tutu.com slash at sign Carolyn underscore Hines. You can also look up under the new title where I put it as Carolyn Talks Podcast and YouTube channel. That's on YouTube, but also in my um, R3 page, you can find it there as well as that. And of course, my R3 page is r3.com. That's A B T H or R Y dot com slash carolyn heinz find links to all of my published work there the youtube channel the different um podcasts that i have which is um carolyn talks or you can also find it on her so here's what happened but also beyond the romance my asian drama podcast and if you want my youtube channel you'll see work that i do with africa the african american film critics association there my social media is on twitter and instagram that's carrie cnh job that's at c-a-r-i-e c-n-h-1-2 always find me on twitter talking and I'm posting work on my Instagram as well and sometimes videos of my dog Yoko and um and 
I, I'm gonna I'm working on more interviews. Like this one is gonna publish before my interviews for the Hot Docs, which is an in which is a competition um, film festival in Toronto. Let me get the correct title. It is the Hot Docs Canadian International Documentary Festival. <laughs> And it's held in Toronto. And I'm doing uh, some interviews for that as well. So look up for those up upcoming interviews. And um, until the next episode of Caroline Talks, everyone, stay safe. Bye.